When it comes to technological achievements and national prestige, few feats can compare to launching a satellite into space. Since the Soviet Union launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik 1, on October the 4th, 1957, 11 other government bodies have developed indigenous orbital launch capability. The United States, France, China, Japan, India, Israel, Ukraine, Iran, North Korea, South Korea, and a group of 22 nations represented by the European Space Agency. Conspicuously absent from that list is the United Kingdom, which in the late 1960s succeeded in developing this capability only to immediately abandon it. This is the story of the tragically brief British space program. At the end of the Second World War, Britain was well positioned to start its own advanced rocketry program. Like the US and the Soviet Union, the victorious ally had captured dozens of the German V-2 rockets which had rained down on southern England and Belgium at the end of the war, along with many of the scientists and technicians who had built and fired them off. In October 1945, the British Army launched Operation Backfire, in which three captured V-2s were assembled, launched, and then filmed near Cuxhaven in northern Germany. These experiments gave the British a wealth of knowledge and experience on the workings of the German terror weapon. One year later, on December 23, 1946, R.A. Smith and H.E. Ross of the British Interplanetary Society submitted to the Ministry of Supply a design for a modified V-2 that could carry a man into space. Their concept replaced the rocket's one-ton explosive warhead with a pressurized capsule that would detach at apogee and parachute to Earth. Alas, Britain, shattered both physically and financially by the war, could not afford to fund such a project, and all plans for military and civilian rocketry were quietly shelved. But this would soon change thanks to two significant world events. The first was the passing of the Atomic Energy Act by US President Harry S. Truman on August 1, 1946. Though British scientists had contributed greatly to the Manhattan Project and the British government had assumed that its special relationship would keep nuclear research flowing between the two countries, the 1946 Act prohibited the United States from sharing atomic secrets with any foreign nation, even wartime allies like Britain and Canada. The second event came on August 29, 1949, when the Soviet Union detonated detonated its first atomic bomb, shattering the US nuclear monopoly and shifting the Cold War into a dangerous new phase. Now facing a nuclear-armed enemy mere hours away and cut off from US nuclear research, Britain embarked on a crash nuclear program of its own, culminating in the detonation of its first atomic bomb, codenamed Hurricane, off the Montebello Islands in northwest Australia on October 2, 1952. But while Britain was now a nuclear-armed nation, it still chose not to pursue large-scale military rocketry, instead basing its nuclear deterrence on gravity bombs dropped from a trio of manned jet aircraft dubbed the V-Bombers, the Handley Page Victor, the Vickers Valiant, and the Avro Vulcan. By the time these aircraft entered service, they had already been rendered all but useless by advancements in Soviet aerial defenses. So, in April 1945, the UK and the US signed an agreement to cooperatively develop a pair of ballistic missiles to serve as a viable deterrent against Soviet nuclear attack. The American design, the AM-65 Atlas, would be an intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM, with a range of 9,300 kilometers, while the British design would be a medium-range ballistic missile, or IRBM, with a range of 3,700 kilometers. In accordance with the post-war British system of rainbow codes, the latter was dubbed Blue Streak. And for more on this rather eccentric system of code names, please do check out our previous video, Britain's Bizarre Post-War Rainbow Codes. Designed and built by de Havilland propellers of Lowstock, Lancashire, Blue Steel stood 24 meters tall, weighed 90 tons fully loaded, and was fueled by kerosene and liquid oxygen. Like the Atlas missile, it was based on Blue Streak featured balloon style propellant tanks made of thin stainless steel, which were kept rigid by the pressure of the propellants inside them. This greatly reduced the rocket's weight, allowing it to loft its projected 3 megaton thermonuclear warhead all the way to Moscow. The first static test firings of Blue Streak rocket engines and complete missiles took place in 1955 and 1956 at the newly built Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Test Center at RAF Spadedum in Cumbria and at the Needles Battery on the Isle of Wight. Meanwhile, a separate test program codenamed Project Dazzle was underway in Australia to develop the missile's warhead. As designed, Blue Streak would climb up to an altitude of 250 kilometers beyond the edge of space, whereupon the warhead would detach and plunge back through the atmosphere. This would expose the warhead to tremendous heat on re-entry, potentially causing it to burn up. To help determine the ideal shape and construction of the warhead, in 1955, aerospace manufacturer Saunders Rowe Limited began work on a small research rocket codenamed Black Knight. 
standing 12 meters high and fueled by a combination of kerosene and high-test hydrogen peroxide or HTP, Black Knight was designed to carry a miniature warhead nose cone to an altitude of 225 kilometers and release it, allowing observers on the ground to track its re-entry through the atmosphere. Later versions were built with a powered second stage that could propel the nose cone earthwards at speeds of up to 18,000 kilometers an hour. As nowhere in the British Isles had the space needed for full-scale rocket testing, Black Knight launches were conducted at the Woomera Rocket Range in South Australia, established in 1947 as a joint test site for Anglo-Australian weapons. The first launch took place on September 7, 1958, achieving a world record altitude of 564 kilometers. A further 22 launches would take place over the next seven years, the rocket proving so reliable and cost-effective that it continued to be used as a high-altitude research vehicle even after Project Dazzle had ended. The first full-scale launches of the Blue Streak missile were scheduled for 1960, but on April the 13th of that year, Defense Minister Harold Watkinson announced the cancellation of the project. While the unexpected cancellation confused the British public and angered the aerospace industry that had worked hard for six years to develop the missile, there was a cold logic to the decision. For one thing, the project was grossly expensive, its cost ballooning from an estimated £50 million in 1955 to nearly £300 million by 1959. But, more importantly, Blue Streak would likely have been useless as a nuclear deterrent. Liquid oxygen can't be stored for long periods without boiling off, meaning that the missile had to be fueled immediately before launch. This process took up four and a half minutes, longer than the maximum warning time Britain would have of an incoming Soviet attack, making Blue Streak highly vulnerable to first strike. De Havilland tried to mitigate this problem by creating a system whereby missiles could be fueled and kept on standby for up to 10 hours. All the missiles in a battery would be fueled and readied in rotation, meaning at least one was available for immediate launch. This system, however, relied on a period of rising international tensions to allow the first missiles to be readied and was useless against a surprise attack. Another system developed to protect Blue Streak against a preemptive strike was the hardened underground missile silo, a British invention later exported to the United States. However, construction on the first silos at RAF Spadidum was still underway when Blue Streak was cancelled outright. In its place, Britain adopted the American air launch Douglas GAM-87 Skybolt missile, which promised to revitalize the V-bomber force by allowing it to launch nuclear strikes from beyond the range of Soviet air defenses. Unfortunately, the Skybolt was plagued by technical problems that prevented its adoption by the RAF, leaving Britain without a viable nuclear deterrent and sparking a diplomatic crisis between the UK and the US. The so-called Skybolt crisis was only resolved in 1962 when the US agreed to sell Britain UGM-27 Polaris submarine launch ballistic missiles. Able to travel, undetected, and strike without warning, Polaris submarines proved a far superior deterrent to the V-Bomber Force or Blue Streak. Indeed, today, the Royal Navy's four Vanguard-class submarines, each armed with 16 newer Trident II missiles, constitute the entirety of the UK's nuclear arsenal. Meanwhile, on April 26, 1962, Britain succeeded in launching its first satellite, Ariel 1, though not aboard a British rocket, but rather the American Thor Delta. While an impressive achievement, the mission was short-lived as barely two months later, Ariel 1 was severely damaged by the American Starfish Prime high-altitude nuclear test. And for more on this, please do check out our previous video that time the US accidentally nuked Britain's first satellite. Still keen on developing indigenous launch capability as well as deflecting criticism for cancelling Blue Streak, the British government proposed repurposing the missile as the first stage of a civilian satellite launcher. One early proposal by the Royal Aircraft Establishment, codenamed Black Prince, used Blue Streak as its first stage, a modified Black Knight as the second, and a military solid fuel rocket motor as the third. However, the projected $62 million price tag was too high for Britain to bear alone, so the government sought out partners to help fund the project. Commonwealth nations like Canada and Australia were uninterested, so Britain turned instead to a group of European nations who, in 1964, joined together to form the European Launcher Development Organization, or ELDO. The goal of ELDO was to develop a three-stage launch vehicle called Europa, capable of placing a 1,000-kg satellite into a 500-kilometer orbit, with each stage being designed and built by a different nation. The British Blue Streak would form the first stage, the French Coralie the second, and the West German Asteris the third. In addition, Italy would supply the first ELDO satellite, the Netherlands and Belgium, the tracking and telemetry systems, and Australia, an associate member, the launch site at Wimera. 
The first full-scale test of Blue Streak, now the Europa First Stage, took place at Woomera on the 5th of June 1964. The launch and ascent went smoothly, but propellant sloshing in the tanks led to uncontrollable vibrations at the 142nd mark, causing the rocket to disintegrate. A further four successful and six unsuccessful launches were conducted at Woomera before the project was moved to the French launch site at Kuro, French Guiana, in South America. Here, the first test launch of all three Europa stages was conducted on November 5, 1971. While all three stages worked perfectly, after three minutes, a rogue electrostatic discharge caused the guidance system to erroneously report that the rocket was veering off course. This prompted the range safety officer to initiate self-destruct. In the wake of this failure, ELDO abandoned the Europa design and Britain left the group. In 1975, the group merged with the European Space Research Organization to form the European Space Agency, which on December 24, 1973, successfully launched the first of the highly successful Ariane family of launch vehicles, versions of which are still in use to this day. Following its withdrawal from ELDO, Britain's prospects of becoming an independent spacefaring nation appeared bleak. However, in 1964, engineers at Saunders Row had submitted a proposal for a small satellite launcher based on the hydrogen peroxide technology developed for the Black Knight research rocket. Dubbed Black Arrow, the compact 30-meter rocket used kerosene peroxide motors for its first and second stages and a waxwing solid motor for the third, allowing it to loft a 100-kilogram payload into low Earth orbit. Furthermore, the first stage was deliberately made the same diameter as Europa's Coralie second stage, allowing Black Arrow to use Blue Streak as a first stage for even greater performance. Indeed, while the blueprints specified most dimensions in Imperial units, the first stage diameter was given in metric units to maintain compatibility with the European rocket. Believing they could now achieve independent launch capability before Europa, Britain withdrew from ELDO and focused its effort on Black Arrow. However, it remained committed to supplying two Blue Streak first stages to ELDO until 1976. The first Black Arrows were shipped to the Woomera rocket range in early 1969. Due to its stubby shape and red high-visibility paint used on the payload fairing, the diminutive vehicle became affectionately known as the Lipstick Rocket. The first suborbital test launch, designated R0, took place on June 28, 1969, with dummy second and third stages. Almost immediately, an electrical fault in the engine gimballing system caused the rocket to roll erratically and break up, the remains being blown up by the range safety officer. The second launch, R1, conducted on March 4, 1970, was more successful, reaching an altitude of 550 kilometers. The first full-up orbital test of the Black Arrow R2 took place on September 2, 1970, with the rocket carrying Orba, a simple satellite designed to measure the density of the upper atmosphere. Unfortunately, however, the second stage shut down 13 seconds early, and the rocket and its payload failed to reach orbit. Even worse, on July 29, 1971, Frederick Caulfield, Minister of State for Trade and Industry, announced the cancellation of the Black Arrow program. Once again, the decision was purely a practical one. Without a more powerful first stage, Black Arrow could only place small satellites into low Earth orbit, making it of limited scientific and commercial value. It was also expensive, with the UK government determining that it was cheap to use American-made scout rockets. But Black Arrow would get one last chance to achieve glory. As the components of the fourth and final rocket, R3, had already been delivered to Woomera when the cancellation was announced, permission was granted to proceed with the launch. As Roy Domit, an uh, engineer on the project, later recalled, there was pride in getting it away and making sure it worked, but there was also a lot of regret because the project had been cancelled. People were upset, but although the project had been cancelled, funding was still there for that year and the team were already in Australia. I think they decided to just go ahead with it. Australia was so far away, so it was almost out of sight and out of mind. Another engineer, Richard Trevermain Smith, remembered many of his colleagues being cautiously optimistic to quote him, There was a determination to get on and finish the job. It wasn't really thought of as being significant at the time. The feeling was, I am sure we will do something else. The ideas and the engineering were there, but everybody was squabbling over the pennies. To memorialize, and perhaps subtly protest the cancellation, the engineers enacted a cheeky name change. R4's intended payload, a 66 kilogram spacecraft designed to study the effects of the space environment on communication satellites, was originally dubbed Puck, from the mischievous sprite from William Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream. Following Black Arrow's cancellation, however, it was renamed Prospero, after the sorcerer in The Tempest who gives up his magic powers. And that might just be the most British thing to have ever happened. Prospero successfully reached orbit on October 28, 1971, becoming the first and thus far only satellite to be launched by a British-built rocket. Though Britain has built dozens of satellites since, all have been launched aboard other nations' rockets. The fourth Black Arrow built, R4, was never launched and now hangs in the Science Museum in London, a melancholy memorial for the only country to develop and then abandon its own satellite launcher.